Our vast universe is home to phenomena such as star-devouring black holes, rapidly rotating pulsars, radiant nebulae birthing stars, and countless galaxies. Yet it may not be endless. There could be a distinct edge, a cosmic boundary. Let's embark on a journey to that possible frontier. Visualize the universe as a massive layered structure. At its core is Earth, enveloped by our solar system, which is in turn housed inside a galaxy within this grand universe. As we journey beyond our solar system, passing by the planets from Mars to Neptune, we encounter the heliosphere. Here, the solar wind's velocity plunges dramatically, giving way to the near stagnant wind at the heliopause. Beyond, the ship faces the force of the interstellar wind. Two remarkable emissaries from Earth, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, now reside in this region. They revealed the heliosphere's uneven shape. Venturing further, an asteroid belt known as the Oort Cloud becomes visible, believed by some scientists to source Earth-bound comets. Beyond lies the expansive Milky Way, spanning around 106,000 light-years. Guiding our journey is a cosmic map, identifying our location in the Laniakea supercluster. However, there's more. At a greater scale, the Hydra Centaurus supercluster emerges. At the universe's maximum observable scale, a surprising revelation awaits, evidence suggesting a universe boundary. This edge, located an astounding 10 billion light years away, is a testament to time and evolution. During such a lengthy voyage, our sun might wither or explode, and the Milky Way might merge with the Andromeda galaxy. Our endpoint is the Eridanus Supervoid, a vast empty stretch spanning a billion light years. This void might result from an unfathomable collision, our universe meeting another. This leads to a tantalizing notion of multiple universes, where every choice leads to alternate outcomes in parallel realities. Imagine our universe as a bubble. Eons ago, another bubble universe brushed against ours. Their gravitational interplay caused cosmic distortions. As they separated, a piece of our universe might have been taken, leading to the creation of the Eridanus Supervoid. Eridanus Supervoid covers a region of space about one billion light years in size. This makes it one of the largest known voids in the universe. This superwave is associated with the so-called cold spot in the cosmic microwave background radiation. The temperature in this spot is lower than the average temperature of the background radiation. The exact origin and nature of Eridanus Supervoid is still a subject of research. This object provides scientists with a unique opportunity to study the structure and evolution of the universe on large scales. Yet, perceiving the universe's entirety remains a challenge. Like an ant on a basketball, we see a consistent horizon due to our 3D viewpoint. But adding dimensions could change our perceptions. Could black holes, with their powerful gravitational influence, offer a passage to these other realms? The vast expanse of our universe is filled with intriguing structures, mysteries, and phenomena that continually challenge our understanding of the cosmos. The Eridanus Supervoid, with its immense size and enigmatic nature, stands as a testament to the universe's capacity to astonish and confound us. And for those intrigued by the enigmatic nature of black holes, we invite you to explore more in our other videos. Dive deep into the mysteries of these cosmic giants and join us on a journey of understanding and wonder. Black holes tearing apart enormous stars, pulsars spinning at incredible speeds and emitting powerful beams of energy, colorful nebulae with fireworks of newborn stars, galaxies of every possible color and size. All of these are found within our universe, but it's not infinite. It has a boundary, a literal wall. And beyond that, there's an absolute nothingness. Right now, we're going to make a journey to that wall. But first things first, our universe is like a humongous nesting doll. If you open it up, there's a smaller one inside. It's a galaxy. Inside that is an even smaller doll. That's our solar system. And the smallest doll of all is the Earth. 
each of these dolls has boundaries that we're going to cross. For that, we'll need a spaceship and a big one. It also has to be able to move a hundred times faster than the speed of light. You get on board and start the engines. 62 miles above sea level is our first boundary. That's 10 times higher than passenger planes fly. This point is called the Kármán line. It separates the atmosphere of the Earth from outer space. Now we fly further to the edge of our solar system. We turn on the hyperdrives and fly past Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. We've traveled a distance of 100 astronomical units. 1 AU is the distance from Earth to the Sun. And here's the boundary of our solar system, the heliosphere. Here, the speed of the solar wind decreases rapidly. First, it drops from 620,000 miles per hour to the speed of sound. Then, there's a layer called the heliopause. This is where the wind almost vanishes. And then, our ship experiences a bow wave. This is where we feel the force of the interstellar wind, which collides with the boundary of our solar system. When you pass this boundary, you find yourself in the dark of interstellar space. And here, you can find two human-made objects that made this trip for the first time in history. They're Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Voyager 1 crossed that boundary in 2004. Voyager 2 did it in 2007. These space probes discovered that the heliosphere is not a perfect ball around the sun. Its southern boundary is 10 AUs closer to the star than the northern one. So, we're moving in interstellar space and will soon approach a stone wall around our solar system. 200,000 AUs further, and there it is. This wall of rock is the Oort cloud. In fact, it's a pile of asteroids that surround our world. Scientists speculate that the Oort cloud could be the source of comets and meteorites that fall to Earth, but they're so sparse that we easily fly between them. Now we're in complete darkness. The Milky Way is about 106,000 light years wide. In a conventional rocket, it would take billions of years to fly across that distance. But you throttle to the max. You masterfully fly past the stars and planets as if on a racetrack. And within minutes, you're at the edge of our galaxy. There's no more interstellar wind. All you see are bright dots somewhere in the distance. These dots are huge galaxies. We need to look at a map to make a route to the edge of our entire universe. You're here, near the Milky Way galaxy. It's part of a cluster of galaxies called the Linnea Kea Supercluster. But even this huge thing is like a little street in a big city. Zooming out, we find Hydra Centaurus Supercluster. Thousands of galaxies on the map look like little dots. Maximum zoom out! This is our entire observable universe. We thought it was infinite, but we may have proof that it has a boundary. It's here, 10 billion light years away from our home. Even if you travel at the speed of light, a trip there would take twice as long as our whole planet has existed. During that time, the sun will either fade away or explode like a supernova, destroying our entire solar system. And if you can live that long and then return home, you will see that our galaxy is there no more. It's long since collided with the Andromeda galaxy and merged into one big cosmic body. Luckily, your ship is able to warp space-time so that this journey will literally take a few seconds. Boom! Congratulations! You've arrived at your destination, the Eridanus Supervoid. Some scientists believe this location is the evidence of collisions of our universe with something big enough to leave such a large scar. The Eridanus Supervoid is an empty and cold space one billion light-years wide. If you think of this void as a cup, it would fit at least 10,000 galaxies, and it appeared after an accident of gigantic proportions. The object that crashed into our universe was… another universe! Yes, other universes may actually exist. Imagine that our entire universe is a huge bubble that contains all the clusters of galaxies in the observable universe. There could be an infinite number of such bubbles. They could have been born during the Big Bang. These universes may be different from ours. They may have other galaxies and nebulae. But these bubbles could also be parallel universes. This means that if you chose cereal over oatmeal in the morning, in another universe, your twin would choose the oatmeal. Every choice you ever made in life had completely different consequences in a parallel universe. And because the number of choices are infinite, there's a whole infinity of parallel universes. So, like a regular bubble, 
Our universe has a wall that is near the Eridanus supervoid. Long ago, another bubble flew past ours. As they approached each other, their gravitational fields began to interact. Our boundary wall began to deform and pull toward the other universe. The same thing happened on the other side. Then the walls of our universes came into contact. But as these bubbles moved, their connection began to break. And the other universe just ripped a huge chunk of ours. A cold void was formed at the point of collision. And that was the Eridanus supervoid. The problem is that the universe looks the same to the observer, regardless of point of view. For example, imagine a basketball hanging in the air. Now if we put an ant on the ball and tell it to find the edge of the ball, it will start running around it, making an infinite number of circles. But the landscape around the ant will not change. All it will see is a rounded horizon. That's because the ball remains the same from any point of view. The same thing happens to us when we try to find the edge of our universe, all because we imagine the world in three-dimensional space, and our view is limited. For example, you see an ordinary square in two-dimensional space. But if you add depth and change the point of view, voila! It's a cube. If we could see the universe in four-dimensional space, a square might be something completely different. But maybe we can leave our home bubble. The key to traveling to another universe might be inside a black hole. A black hole is one of the most mysterious objects in the universe. They're so heavy, they warp not only space, but time as well. It's like putting a heavy boulder on a net. The net will sag, and the closer you get to the boulder, the stronger the curvature is. Once you're in the gravitational field of a black hole, you can't leave it. We still don't know what might actually be in the heart of a black hole. Some scientists speculate that white holes also exist. Theoretically, they should be born along with black holes. Except for the color, they're the exact opposite of black holes. Nothing can come close to a white hole. At the moment, there's no data on such objects, but general relativity theory suggests they do exist. There's also a theory that a black hole may be a passage to another universe. When you get into a black hole, you can come out the other side through the event horizon of the white hole. So you bypass the boundary of the universes and find yourself in a completely different world. But we may have proof that a white hole exists. In 2006, scientists discovered an unusual burst of energy somewhere 1.6 billion light years away from Earth. This burst was unique. It didn't look like a supernova explosion or even the merger of two black holes. Some astronomers believe it was the birth of a white hole. But because it was unstable, it was destroyed almost immediately. This process was reminiscent of the birth of our entire universe, the Big Bang. So, scientists called it the Little Bang. You're traveling through deep space, circling stars and entire galaxies. Whoa, looks like this multicolored nebula will soon collapse under its own weight and explode like a supernova. Now let's carefully circle this black hole. Try not to get caught in its gravitational field, or it'll swallow you like a space monster. Hmm, wait, what's that strange structure right there? It's a glowing wall. And if you look closely, each glowing dot is an entire galaxy. That wall has about 100,000 of these galaxies. The Milky Way has 100 billion stars. So this wall holds a quadrillion, that's 10 followed by 15 zeros, of stars like our sun. This giant structure is called the South Pole Wall. It's located about 500 million light years from Earth. By comparison, the closest star to our home is Proxima Centauri, and it's about 4.2 light years away. Rockets can cover that distance in about 73,000 years. So the journey to the South Pole Wall may take longer than our solar system exists. And this wall is simply gigantic, even on a cosmic scale. It's about 1.37 billion light years long. To give you an idea of how large that is, the Milky Way is only 100,000 light years wide. But you can't see this wall even with the most powerful telescope. The problem is that the Milky Way itself obstructs your view. It's so bright that it's hiding this wall. It's like trying to look at the starry sky in a metropolis. The light pollution won't let you do that. Scientists have been able to detect this galactic wall by measuring redshift. We know that all objects in the universe are moving. They spread out from each other as a result of the Big Bang, which happened billions of years ago. And when galaxies move, their light waves change slightly. 
By measuring this change, we can understand what the object is and how it moves. And this wall isn't even the largest in our universe. This is the Hercules Corona Borealis Great Wall. It's a giant flat superstructure about 10 billion light years wide. That's around 10% of the entire observable universe. And it's also a wall. That is, a cluster of galaxies. We were able to detect this giant structure by gamma ray bursts. It's the brightest electromagnetic event in the universe. You could even see it in the far reaches of our universe. Such bursts are a very rare event. In the Milky Way, for example, it happens once every few million years. If we notice many such bursts in a short time from the same place, it means that there are many objects like the Milky Way in that place. So, there are a lot of galaxies out there. Another unusual giant structure in the universe is the huge, large quasar group. It's about 4 billion light years across. So it takes a photon of light almost as long as our planet has existed just to get from one side of the structure to the other. And if you put the huge large quasar group on the scale, it would be 6.1 billion billion times heavier than our sun. Scientists have found that there are at least 73 quasars in that structure. These are some of the most unusual objects in the universe. They are the active cores of galaxies. At the center of a quasar is a supermassive black hole. This giant eats up the matter around it. A wild force of gravity twists the matter around the black hole, forming a disk. And this disk is the source of the strongest radiation out there. By comparison, the radiation from a single quasar is tens or hundreds of times stronger than that of all the stars in our galaxy put together. Because of such strong radiation, we can detect quasars even at very long distances. That's why they're also called beacons of the universe. Scientists use quasars to study the universe and the movement within it. One of the most distant quasars from us is about 13.1 billion light years away. This makes it one of the oldest objects in the universe. It appeared about 690 million years after the Big Bang, and it's almost three times older than our solar system. It's still glowing with extreme brightness, about 4 and 14 zeros times brighter than the sun. Scientists explain that at the center of the giant is a supermassive black hole, 800 million times heavier than the sun. All these giant structures are just building blocks of our universe. Look, this is our solar system. Now, zoom out a little, and this is where our home star is in the Milky Way galaxy. Zoom out again. Here's a local group of galaxies. All the bright spots here are galaxies. Here's Andromeda, and here's the Triangulum galaxy, plus a few dozen other slightly smaller galaxies. They're all gravitationally connected. The size of this structure is about 10 million light years. That's 100 times the width of our galaxy. Zoom out, please. This one is the Virgo supercluster. It's 20 times larger than the local group. There are about 30,000 different galaxies, and the mass of the whole thing is about 1 in 15 zeros solar masses. Zoom out again, Laniakea. This structure is almost three times larger. It includes the Virgo supercluster and other smaller clusters. And there are about 100,000 galaxies here. Huh, it's not over yet. Zoom out one more time. Here's the Pisces Cetus supercluster complex. This giant galactic structure contains about 60 clusters of galaxies. So there are more galaxies in it than grains of sand in the desert. You know what to do. Zoom out. Phew, this is the observable universe. There are over 500 billion galaxies. And the stars? Well, there are about 1 billion trillion stars. The observable universe has its own structure. Clusters of galaxies form chains and walls, as you've seen before. But these strands are separated by huge regions of absolute emptiness. These areas are called voids. In these places, there is no matter at all. There are fewer molecules in the voids than in an empty room. One of these voids has a very mystical reputation. It's the Eridnus supervoid, or the cold spot. It appeared here only 380,000 years after the Big Bang. It's almost 1 billion light years wide and could hold hundreds or thousands of galaxies with trillions of stars. Some scientists believe that this cold spot may have been the result of the largest collision ever. A collision of universes. There's a theory that our universe is some kind of bubble. A huge sphere that contains all these walls and chains of galaxies. 
Now imagine that there's an infinite number of these bubbles. They could be parallel worlds or different universes. Many years ago, one bubble came close to the bubble of our universe. Their walls touched and the two universes connected for a while. It's like two drops of water coming together. But that universe kept moving. The area where the bubbles joined became thinner and thinner until that connection broke and the two bubbles detached from each other. At this point, the second universe ripped some of the material out of our bubble. All those galaxies that used to fill the Eridanus supervoid ended up in a parallel universe. Scientists supposed we might travel through other bubbles. Flying to the supposed wall of our universe would take forever. And then it would take even longer to fly through interuniversal space. So we have to use portals or wormholes. Here's how it works. Imagine a piece of paper with point A on one side and point B on the other. Instead of moving all the way across the sheet of paper, we just fold the sheet so that point A is right above point B. All that's left to do is make a small hole and the journey takes only moments. Some scientists believe that such shortcuts through universes lie inside black holes. But how do you survive falling into a black hole? You just have to pick one that's big enough. It's all about gravity. Imagine you're falling into a black hole right now. The closer you get to it, the stronger effect it has on you. It intensifies with every inch. At one point, the gravitational force that affects your head is much stronger than the one that affects your feet. Then you turn into spaghetti. Yum. But if you choose a supermassive black hole, like the ones at the centers of galaxies, the gravitational force in them increases gradually. They can be millions of times heavier than the sun and much bigger. But the gravitational force on your head and your feet will be almost equal, and you will still feel comfortable. Who knows? Maybe if you manage to survive a fall into such a massive black hole, you'd find yourself in a completely different universe where different laws of physics apply. But so far, this is just a theory. Our home Milky Way galaxy has two very well-known satellite galaxies, the large and small Magellanic Clouds. They were named after Ferdinand Magellan, an explorer who led the first circumnavigation of the globe a whopping 500 years ago. During this expedition, two groups of clouds were discovered in the southern night sky. Those are now known as the Magellanic Clouds. But they're not the only ones. The Milky Way is surrounded by at least 61 other galaxies within 1.4 million light years. For comparison, our neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy, is 2.5 million light years away from us. And still, astronomers think there are many more satellite galaxies, perhaps even too many. But first, let's figure out what a satellite galaxy is. Our Sun is just one of a truly huge collection of stars in the Milky Way. Hundreds of billions of stars orbit the center of our galaxy. But something much bigger orbits the Milky Way's center too, other galaxies. They are way less massive, but have their own stars. We can compare the Milky Way to our Sun and those other galaxies to planets. Astronomers call such formations satellite galaxies. The Milky Way's biggest satellite galaxy is the Large Magellanic Cloud. It's located about 163,000 light years away and is about 100th the size of our home galaxy. Unlike the spiral Milky Way, the Large Magellanic Cloud doesn't have a clean spiral shape. One theory claims that it's because the Milky Way and other galaxies pull and warp it. In terms of distance, there are two candidates that can fight for the title of the closest satellite galaxy. One of them is so small that scientists consider it a dwarf galaxy. The other is so close that it's still debated whether it's a separate dwarf galaxy or part of our own galaxy. The satellite galaxy everyone agrees on is the Sagittarius Dwarf Spheroidal Galaxy. It's around 50,000 light years away from the center of the Milky Way. But there's a cluster of stars that is even closer than that. Some experts call it the Canis Major Dwarf Galaxy. It's likely to contain about a billion stars and is located so close to the edge of the Milky Way that it's actually closer to our solar system than to the galaxy's center. Some astronomers don't think the Canis Major is its own galaxy. They believe it's simply a dense area of faraway stars, which is still part of the Milky Way. Whatever the case is, 
This bunch of stars was once pulled toward the Milky Way by our galaxy's immense gravity. That's how most satellite galaxies in the area are likely to end up. Once, they might all merge into an even larger Milky Way galaxy. But let's get back to the assumption that the Milky Way has too many satellite galaxies. A team of astronomers has been hunting for such galaxies using the Subaru telescope. So far, they have searched a mere 3% of the sky. And still, they have found nine previously undiscovered satellite galaxies. That's far more than they expected to spot. Interestingly, most of the satellite galaxies orbiting the Milky Way are newcomers. Yes, even the large and small Magellanic clouds. This most recent research hopes to improve our understanding of our corner of the universe with the first detailed search for companion dwarf galaxies. However, the study also has another goal, to figure out dark matter distribution. You see, the current theory claims that the mass of our galaxy consists of two parts, visible matter, like stars and planets, and something invisible, which is hypothetical dark matter. We can't see it directly, but we can feel its gravitational influence through a certain distribution of mass in galaxies. Strangely, the simulation of the dynamics of the galaxy and this dark matter predicts hundreds of satellite galaxies in the Milky Way. Until recently, we only knew about a few of them, which created a contradiction known as the missing satellite problem. Hopefully, the new research will solve this problem. The team admits that so far, their research has been based on statistically small numbers. Several assumptions have also been made based on a particular distribution of satellite galaxies. Follow-up studies of stars in the satellite galaxies and high-resolution imaging are definitely needed to progress further. Recently, scientists have discovered a humbling collection of monster galaxy superclusters, 662 in total. One of them is so ginormous, it can make anyone terrified. It's called the Inosto Supercluster, and it's located 3 billion light-years away from Earth. This particular supercluster was called after an Estonian astrophysicist who was one of the discoverers of the large-scale structure of the universe. This supercluster is truly staggering in terms of size and mass. Its mass is the same as that of around 26 quadrillion suns, which is 26 followed by 15 zeros. The galaxy supercluster is so huge that it would take a light signal 360 million years to travel from one side of it to the other. The rest of the discovered superclusters can't measure up to the Anastos supercluster, and still, they are no slouches in the size or mass department. Using the discovered sample, a team of researchers led by astronomers from Tartu Observatory managed to calculate the average supercluster size and mass. It turned out that the typical mass of a supercluster in that collection was about six quadrillion solar masses, and the typical size of a supercluster was around 200 light years across. It means that the average supercluster is more than 2,000 times larger than our home Milky Way galaxy. Another comparison for you. If the Sun had the same mass as a golf ball, a supercluster would be as massive as Mount Everest. During a closer examination of the properties of these superclusters, astronomers found out that galaxy clusters within these superclusters are heavier than those found outside the superclusters. It proves that galaxies in such superclusters grow and develop in a different way from galaxies elsewhere. But even though the superclusters have tremendous masses, individual galaxies they contain seem to be less dense than others. Most likely, it happens because this insane mass is spread across huge volumes. At the same time, supercluster galaxies are dense enough to have a tremendous gravitational effect on the matter filling the superclusters themselves, including their dark matter content. This matter is invisible to human eyes since it doesn't interact with light. Astronomers hope that the supercluster discovery will help us not only better understand how such vast collections of galaxies come together, but also allow us to figure out the answers to the mysteries of dark matter and dark energy. Our universe consists of normal matter, dark matter, and dark energy. Normal matter, which is everything you can see with your own eyes or with the help of instruments, 
makes up around 5% of the universe. Dark energy takes up around 68%, and about 27% of the universe is dark matter. Now, dark energy is believed to be a force responsible for the expansion of the universe. Astronomers wouldn't even know the thing existed if, several decades ago, they hadn't found out that the expansion of the universe wasn't slowing down. Quite the opposite, it was accelerating. It meant there had to be some enigmatic force counteracting gravity. It was dubbed dark energy. As for dark matter, it is supposed to explain how objects work together. Potential candidates for dark matter vary from strange particles to super dim objects. The European Space Agency's Planck satellite even helped astronomers calculate how much dark energy the universe has to contain to explain the way its expansion is constantly speeding up. But let's get back to our superclusters. The most curious thing is that the team behind the discovery has noticed that galaxies in these superclusters seem to be separating at lower expansion speeds than expected. What it means is still unclear. But hopefully, studying the superclusters will help us figure out the mystery of these troubling discrepancies observed in the universe's uneven rate of expansion. Recently, the James Webb Space Telescope has unearthed a mysterious ancient galaxy. And it might completely change our understanding of the nature of dark matter and the process of galaxy formation. The telescope has managed to spot a stellar population bigger than our home Milky Way galaxy from 11 billion years ago, and it shouldn't actually exist. This galaxy is massive and is home to extremely old stars. They formed in the early universe. The problem is that this new observation upends our current cosmological models since by the time of the galaxy's birth, not enough dark matter had built up to seed such a formation. Researchers have been chasing this particular galaxy for seven years. They spent endless hours observing it with the help of the two largest telescopes on our planet to figure out how old it was. Unfortunately, it was too faint and too red, so no one could measure it. Only after scientists moved their observations to space and started using the James Webb Telescope did they manage to confirm the nature of the galaxy. The thing is, Unlike the Hubble Space Telescope, which orbits around Earth, James Webb moves around the Sun one million miles away from Earth. That's why it made it possible to see the galaxy clearer. Previously, astronomers were sure that in early cosmic times, there were very few huge galaxies. But recent findings challenge these theoretical models. Extremely massive, dormant galaxies have been discovered as early as one to two billion years after the Big Bang and the beginning of the universe. The scientist who led the spectral analysis of the James Webb Telescope data said that they were doing everything possible to confirm the oldest galaxies that existed deep in the universe. When they did, it pushed the boundaries of the current understanding of how galaxies form and evolve. And now, the main question is how they managed to form so fast in the early universe, and what enigmatic mechanisms made them stop forming stars all of a sudden while the rest of the universe was still doing so. Galaxy formation is largely dictated by the concentration of dark matter. You see, around 84% of matter in the universe doesn't emit or absorb light. Astronomers call this stuff, which can neither be seen directly nor detected by indirect means, dark matter. It supposedly affects visible matter, radiation, and the very structure of the universe. Finding extremely massive galaxies so early in the universe is posing serious challenges to our standard model of cosmology. All because astronomers don't think that such monstrous dark matter structures as the ones hosting those massive galaxies had enough time to form. Researchers need more time to figure out how common such ancient galaxies are and how massive they can be. But if they manage to find more of those, it will really upset our ideas of galaxy formation. But it could improve our understanding of the physics of dark matter. Bizarre ancient galaxies aren't the only thing discovered thanks to James Webb. For example, Scientists have long suspected that supermassive black holes could have existed in the early universe, and this theory has been proven only thanks to the JWST and its infrared eye. It showed that an ancient black hole within galaxy Sears 1019 was actively munching on all the matter it could lay its hands on. This hole is from the times when our universe was less than 600 million years old, and that's another mystery we're yet to crack. It's supposed to take way longer than 600 million years for a supermassive black hole to grow to its full potential. 
Astronomers were watching the galaxy, hosting the unusually old black hole as part of the Cosmic Evolution Early Release Science Survey. They saw the galaxy as it was when our 13.8 billion year old universe was just 570 million years old. Besides the ancient black hole, scientists spotted two other ones. Those probably appeared one and 1.1 billion years after the Big Bang. They also discovered 11 ancient galaxies that existed between 470 and 675 million years after the beginning of cosmic history. In March 2018, a team of scientists claimed that they had found a galaxy without dark matter. The thing is, around 84% of matter in the universe doesn't emit or absorb light. Astronomers call this stuff which can neither be seen directly nor detected by indirect means, dark matter. It supposedly affects visible matter, radiation, and the very structure of the universe. It also seems to exert gravitational pull without interacting with light. The existence of this bizarre matter was suggested to explain an even weirder phenomenon. Based on the light scientists can see with their telescopes, the universe acts as if there's much more mass in it and, therefore, much more gravitational force than our theories predict. That's why that galaxy without dark matter might be the first such object ever found in the universe. Plus, it could deal a blow to an alternative theory explaining the weirdness of our universe. According to that theory, gravity acts a bit differently than we thought, but in this case, it should be different everywhere in the universe, including this dark matterless galaxy, not just in some spots. But there's one problem here. This galaxy that is supposedly devoid of any dark matter might actually be filled with it. Another team of physicists posted a study claiming that the galaxy in question was behaving as if it did have dark matter after all. The original paper published in March 2018 based its mind-boggling claim of the dark matter-free galaxy on the way clusters of stars were moving through the thin, diffuse space it occupied. These stars seemed to be traveling at exactly the speed Einstein's equation of general relativity would predict based on visible matter. In other words, more slowly than they would if the galaxy was mostly made up of dark matter. But the newer study suggested differently. Its authors stated that the researchers behind the first paper had measured the distance between the galaxy and our home planet incorrectly. If their suspicions are true, it might mean that the galaxy is actually much closer to us than the original researchers thought. Normally, astronomers calculate the mass of galaxies based on space objects' brightness and distance to them. If the galaxy in question is closer to Earth than we thought earlier, then its dimness means it's less massive than estimated initially. If it turns out to be true and the galaxy is indeed lighter, it will make much more sense. If this is the case, its globular clusters are moving so slowly not because they're stuck in some kind of dark matter desert. Instead, they're simply traveling at a speed normal for a lightweight galaxy. The first team disagrees and states that the new analysis is flawed, saying that the second team seems to be misinterpreting the key distance measurements coming from the Hubble Space Telescope. That's where it gets slightly technical. Pixel variations might have been mistaken for individual stars. If the galaxy was as close as the second team claims, then it would be resolved into a sea of individual stars. But it's not. Instead, the stars are gathered into clusters. In reality though, something deeper than a dispute about the movements in a tiny faraway galaxy is going on. It's an argument about the very existence of dark matter. And here we've got a paradox on our hands. The researchers arguing that the bizarre galaxy doesn't contain dark matter are perceived as offering evidence that dark matter does exist in the universe. Because, do you remember? The alternative theory needs gravity to behave in a different way in all places. For a few decades, a group of scientists has been arguing that the entire idea of dark matter is false. Even though researchers have seen some indirect evidence of dark matter, like its pull on distant stars and galaxies, not even a single fragment of it has been captured. No one has been able to demonstrate its existence. The majority of those who disagree with the idea of dark matter are interested in the alternative theory. The one where gravity is kinda off kilter. And if the real laws of gravity are indeed a bit different than what we can find in physics textbooks, then perhaps we don't need dark matter to explain the behavior of the universe.
Is there a giant mega sun in the center of our Milky Way? Scientists actually thought so for a while because it's the brightest place in the galaxy. It has millions of stars packed into a small area. This area is called the Gigantic Bulge. The Gigantic Bulge has millions more stars per light year than any other part of the galaxy. It can be 10 million times denser than our part of the neighborhood. In some cases, stars in this region are only 5 light days apart. That's like if there was another star in our solar system a bit further away than Pluto on a space scale. But why is this place so dense? When galaxies form, a lot of gas and dust come together under the force of gravity. This material gathers up and eventually forms stars. Gravity and angular momentum balance out, and it starts looking like a flat disk with a pretty bright, bulging, dense core. The stars live their comfy lives, and once they get to the finishing line, they collapse under their own huge weight. Then, the black hole forms. Black holes love to eat everything around them, and the more they eat, the bigger they get. And what place is more perfect for a fine dinner than the galaxy center, where all the space stuff is packed together? So it starts eating surrounding gas and dust, forming an accretion disk. As this material spirals into the black hole, it heats up and emits a lot of energy, which makes the center of the galaxy even brighter. That's why you can find both supermassive black holes and galactic bulges in the centers of all galaxies. The galactic bulge at the center of the Milky Way looks a bit like an ellipse. That's a classical bulge. Stars aren't like our Sun. They move randomly in all possible directions and planes. Plus, they all move at different speeds. So gravity is going crazy there, and this makes the bulge look more like a sphere, or an ellipse. Since they were the first ones to form, they have some of the most ancient stars in our galaxy. But there are also some places of star formations and lots of younger, massive stars that are less than 100 million years old. As we move farther away from the center, things get a bit calmer. Stars start rotating uniformly and become stable. Right now, Earth is in one of the Milky Way's spiral arms called the Orion Arm, pretty far away from the galactic bulge. In our part of the neighborhood, stars are usually about 4 or 5 light years apart. This means that most of a galaxy is actually just black, empty space. Our black hole is called Sagittarius A star. It's a monster about 4 million times the mass of our Sun. It's also about 32 million miles in size, almost like the distance between Mercury and the Sun. But don't worry, it's not attracting the Milky Way inside it, and it's not going to eat us. These black holes are actually super small compared to the entire galaxy, so they can only eat whatever is around. Right now, many stars orbit Sagittarius A star. And even though it emits a huge amount of energy, we can't see its light from Earth without a lot of scientific effort. But why don't we see the center itself? The galactic bulge is so bright that even though it's 26,000 light years away, we should see it shining brightly in our sky. Yet, we don't. Turns out it's all because of space dust. There's a lot of dust between us and the core, and it absorbs most of the visible light. We can only look at the galactic core using other types of light, like near-infrared, gamma ray, and so on. NASA has images of the core in different types of light, and it shows how scarily bright the center is without the dust blocking our view. But not all bright regions are blocked by gas and dust. For example, when we look at dense clusters like the Messier 13, the stars are so close together that they look just like a white spot. Most of our telescopes can't separate them from each other. The satellite galaxy M32, our neighbor near the Andromeda galaxy, has about 84 stars per light year. It's so dense that stars can't be resolved even by the Hubble Space Telescope. To get the idea, our solar system is two light years long. We'd see about 168 stars outside our window if we were there. Our closest star is Alpha Centauri. It's about four light years away from the Sun. If it was just a couple of light days away, it would shine much brighter than the full moon. 
So if we somehow managed to survive in crazily dense star regions, the sky would be white all day long. But it's unlikely that we'd make it. As we get closer to the center of the Milky Way, the chances of finding life get super slim. The gravity of stars is going wild with chaotic movements, so there are barely any planets around. On those miracle planets, the radiation from cosmic rays is skyrocketing. Supernova blasts and star collisions nearby become an everyday occasion, and all the gas around makes it basically impossible to breathe or even see properly. At the same time, as we move further away, there are fewer stars around. Elements that are super useful for life like carbon, oxygen, and iron are produced by stars, so they also drop. Too much radiation is awful, but too low radiation means that there's not enough energy to support chemical reactions, like photosynthesis. Which is why, if there is extraterrestrial life, it would most likely be somewhere in the middle of different galaxies. But some galaxies get their brightness from a so-called active galactic nucleus. These are extremely energetic regions at the center of some galaxies. They shine much brighter than any stars imaginable, although it mostly shines only in certain parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. The brightness comes not from the stars, but from the accretion disk around their supermassive black holes. As the material slowly falls into a black hole, it gathers around it and creates this flat, spinning disk of gas, dust, and other stuff. Since the gravity and friction there are insane, this disk heats up and starts emitting enormous amounts of energy. Also, this disk spins incredibly fast, almost at the speed of light. Because of that, collisions there happen all the time, and they're unimaginably powerful. They release even bigger amounts of energy. Most galaxies don't have an AGN. Those that do, like the galaxy M87 in the Virgo constellation, are called active galaxies. There are also different types of AGNs. The Seyfert galaxies, radio galaxies, and finally, the winners of our space brightness competition, quasars. Imagine things so bright that they can outshine the entire galaxy they belong to. Quasars are a specific type of active galactic nucleus, the most extreme and luminous form. They belong to the supermassive black holes, the biggest ones in our universe. Quasars are like a combination of several things. First, they're the brightest accretion disks in our world because of their behemoth black holes eating everything around. But they have some cool features. For example, they have powerful jets of particles that shoot out from the poles of the black hole at nearly the speed of light. These jets add up to the brightness of the quasar, although they can only be seen in radio wavelengths. The energy they emit is so intense that they can be seen billions of light years away. However, the nearest quasar to us is 600 million light years away, so we can't see them with backyard telescopes. So, when we look at a galaxy through a telescope, we usually see only the brighter core, not the outer parts. Unfortunately, our eyes just aren't made to see things like the active galactic nucleus. So, these stars are the brightest things we can see. But what a beautiful sight it is. These eerie objects are called quasars. They're some of the brightest and most powerful objects in the universe. They lurk in the depths of space, consuming entire galaxies with their insatiable hunger. But what are quasars? Where did they come from? And most importantly, are they dangerous to us? Picture a supermassive black hole, a cosmic monster so massive that it can swallow entire stars and bend the fabric of time. Usually, there's such a black hole in the center of every galaxy. That includes our own Milky Way galaxy. Ours is named Sagittarius A star. Sounds like the name of a hipster coffee shop, but in reality, it's a terrifying celestial body, which is 4 million times heavier than our sun. You could even see it online. For the first time, we took a photo of this black hole in May 2022. Ah, but don't worry. Even though it's super massive, it's not going to swallow us up anytime soon. This black hole is relatively small, and it's too tiny to eat an entire galaxy. So it's more like a cosmic vacuum cleaner that sucks up stars or gas that gets too close. 
But there are black holes in the centers of galaxies that are way heavier and more dangerous than ours. They can weigh millions or even billions of times more than our own sun. Now, imagine one of these monsters. Usually, they're surrounded by a swirling, glowing disk of gas and dust, like water swirling down a drain. It's called an accretion disk, and it's where the magic of quasars happens. As material from the accretion disk falls toward the center, it heats up to millions of degrees, releasing vast amounts of energy in the form of radiation. And this radiation is what we observe as a quasar. So basically, the more material a black hole can consume from its surroundings, the brighter its quasar will be. This is what makes them so bright and powerful, shining like beacons in the night sky. And just imagine, some black holes can actually make entire galaxies their meal. Now, combine their ravenous appetite with some intense radiation, and you'll get a truly awe-inspiring display of cosmic power. No wonder we can see them, even though they're some of the most distant objects in the universe. Quasars were discovered in the late 1950s by accident. Astronomers were just chilling and looking at the sky when suddenly they stumbled upon something strange. Radio signals that had no visible source. By 1960, hundreds of these strange objects had been found. Astronomers named them quasars, short for quasi-stellar radio source. These objects were small and far away, but their energy output was immense and difficult to explain. Some thought that these were new types of stars. Others even proposed wild things, like quasars being made of antimatter or being the end of a wormhole. But all these theories were discarded. A scientist named Martin Schmidt was the first one to get to the truth. However, many astronomers didn't believe him. Schmidt had to do a lot of extra work and gather lots of evidence to prove his theory. And finally, he prevailed. And that's how we discovered quasars. Don't you love the scientific method? And since then, astronomers have been captivated by these objects. Why? Because they have some pretty eerie qualities. Hey, you could call them quasi-quasars. For example, they kind of defy the laws of physics. They emit jets of particles that travel at speeds close to the speed of light. These particles move so fast that they can even distort the very fabric of space and time. But sometimes, they also help us confirm the laws of physics. Now imagine driving a car. As you drive, objects in the rear window start to appear smaller and smaller until they disappear from view entirely. That's exactly what happens with quasars, except they're moving away from us at incredibly fast speeds, up to 90% the speed of light. Mm, wonder why they're trying so hard to sprint away from us. But in any case, this helps us confirm that the universe does expand for real. Another eerie thing about quasars is that they're incredibly old. Some even date back to the time when galaxies were forming, or to the birth of our universe. Additionally, quasars are some of the most distant objects that we can observe in the universe. Some of them are located billions of light years away from us. This means that when we observe a quasar, we're actually seeing light that was emitted billions of years ago, when the Earth was much younger and different than it is today. And that's why they work like cosmic time capsules. Studying them gives us a glimpse into the distant past. You see, galaxies are like giant cities, with stars and planets serving as the inhabitants. But just like cities evolve over time, galaxies also undergo changes as they age. And that's where quasars come in. They're like the urban planners of the universe. They shape the galaxies through their powerful gravitational influence. By eating galaxies and releasing intense radiation, they can trigger star formation and shape the structure of the galaxy itself. It's like the cosmic equivalent of a master chef, or a leaf blower, you pick. For example, let's take galaxy mergers. Here are two massive entities coming together, swirling and spinning around each other. As they get closer and closer, their gravitational pull becomes stronger, and they start to merge into a new, bigger galaxy. It's a beautiful and dramatic process, one that can take millions of years to complete. But all this doesn't go without consequences. The gas and dust within the galaxies collide, creating massive shockwaves that trigger the birth of new stars and even supermassive black holes. And this is where the quasars come into play. Some quasars may be born during these galactic get-togethers. And thanks to this, they help us study the effects of this process and the evolution of galaxies over time. 
But it's not all serious science and no fun. For example, how about gravitational lensing? Now, that's something straight out of a sci-fi movie. It happens when the gravity of a massive object, like a quasar, bends the path of light from a more distant object, like a galaxy, behind it. It's like having a really big magnifying glass in space. When you combine a quasar with gravitational lensing, you get some seriously awesome cosmic eye candy. The result is kind of like a funhouse mirror, where objects appear warped and twisted in strange and mesmerizing ways. Gravitational lensing isn't just for show. It's also a powerful tool for astronomers to study the distribution of dark matter and the structure of the universe. And that's not all. Some scientists have proposed that quasars could help us build the map of the universe. They can work like giant neon road signs. Turn left at the quasar and you'll reach your destination. They're like lighthouses that help us navigate through space. By analyzing the light from different quasars, Astronomers can determine the distances between them and create a 3D map of the universe. And the best part? Quasars are located throughout the entire universe. That's why this cosmic map can give us a comprehensive view of the universe on a scale that was previously unimaginable. Who knew that a giant galaxy eater could be so useful? There's still a lot we don't know about these mysterious objects. In 2007, a team of astronomers made an astonishing discovery the first true binary quasar. Basically, this means two huge quasars spiraling around each other. What's more, they were hiding in plain sight. For years, scientists had known about this radio source, but had never realized that it actually comes from one lovely couple. The astronomers also estimated that this pair may have a mass of about 100 billion suns. They're super distant, though, at an astounding 12 billion light years away from our blue planet. Overall, quasars are a fascinating and complex phenomenon that continues to baffle and intrigue scientists. They may be cosmic galaxy eaters, but they're also playing a critical role in the formation and evolution of the universe. And who knows, maybe one day they'll become one of the keys to unlocking the mysteries of our universe. Oh, you quasi quasars. In the heart of the galaxy, there lies a mysterious object, the likes of which no astronomer has ever seen. It streaks across the sky like a shooting star on caffeine. So what is this mysterious blob, and how is it related to the black hole in the center of our galaxy? Let's find out. This thing is called X7. It's the mysterious blob that's been hanging around our galaxy's supermassive black hole for decades. Some even say it's been lurking around there for, like, hundreds of years. We know a few things about X7. For example, it weighs around 50 times as much as Earth. It may sound like a lot if you're an Earthling, but in space, that's like a tiny drop in the ocean. X7 is also moving pretty fast, at speeds of up to 700 miles per second. That's faster than you trying to catch the last slice of pizza before your roommate gets to it. But what in the world is this thing? A magic star we've never seen before? An extraterrestrial spaceship? Well, there are some theories connected to the blob's future tragic fate. Unfortunately, X7's days are numbered. Right now, it's on a 170-year-long elliptical orbit around the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. But it's not going to make it that far. Each year, it's spiraling closer and closer to the black hole. In just a few years, it will become spaghettified. Yes, that's a real scientific term. And finally get sucked in, never to be seen again. There are supermassive black holes in the centers of all galaxies, including our very own Milky Way. These black holes are so massive that they warp space-time, causing nearby stars to orbit around them at incredible speeds. They serve as cosmic vacuum cleaners that suck in anything and everything that comes close enough. The black hole in our galaxy is called the Sagittarius A star. Sounds like the name of a fancy Hollywood celebrity, doesn't it? But this celestial object is far more impressive than any mere mortal. It's about 4 million times more massive than our sun, which means it could probably eat our entire solar system for breakfast. 
But don't worry, these black holes may seem really scary, but in reality, they're too small to compete with an entire galaxy. They'll just suck in a couple of the nearest stars, and that's all. Also, Sagittarius A star doesn't seem to have a very good appetite. It's been observed to be pretty quiet lately, which is good news for us. But even if it were super greedy, it wouldn't pose any threat to us. This black hole is over 26,000 light years away. From Earth, we can see it in the Sagittarius constellation. In 2022, the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration released the first ever image of Sagittarius A star. It took years of collaboration and technology to capture this stunning image. And this is our second photo of a black hole in history. The first one was released in 2019, and it showed the supermassive black hole called M87 star. Yes, they both have star in their names. Don't try to make it make sense. Anyway, you may remember this photo as the first ever image of a black hole ever. It went crazy viral across the internet. And this black hole, M87 star, located in the Messier 87 galaxy, is way scarier than Sagittarius A star. You thought 4 million solar masses is impressive? Then how about 2.5 billion solar masses? M87 is a real monster. It's also known for its powerful jets of plasma, which are so energetic that they extend thousands of light years from the black hole's center. If M87 were a superhero, it would be Iron Man with his repulsor beams on full blast. Now, technically, you can't take a photo of a black hole itself since it's, well, black. No light can escape its grasp. But the glowing orange ring in this photo shows the matter surrounding Sagittarius A star. It's called the accretion disk, a swirling disk of hot gas that spirals the center, heating up to millions of degrees in the process. It's like a giant fiery vortex, but with no escape. And the shadow in the center indicates the black hole itself. Inside that shadow, there's an event horizon the event horizon is the boundary around the black hole, beyond which nothing, not even light, can escape its gravitational pull. It's the point of no return, where the gravitational force is so strong that even the fastest object in the universe, light, can't escape. Once you cross the event horizon, you're doomed to fall toward the center of the black hole, where the laws of physics as we know them break down. And this is exactly the fate that awaits our unfortunate X7. Right now, the pure blob is getting stretched and yanked by powerful tidal forces. By the way, before it meets its untimely demise, X7 is expected to put on a bit of a show. Its closest approach to the black hole, called periastron, is projected to happen in 2036. And when it finally gets torn apart by the Sagittarius A star's gravitational forces, there may be some cool fireworks to see. But this is not the most important thing. The funny part is, X7's future end may help us finally understand what the heck even is this thing? A team of scientists have been studying how a strange blob orbits the black hole. And that's when they discovered that X7 has stretched to almost twice its initial length. And what does that mean? Well. It suggests that X7 is most likely made of debris ejected during a recent collision between two stars. Yep, you heard that right, a space car crash. Imagine this, two stars fall in love and start circling each other for many years. After that, they finally merge together. At this moment, they eject tons of gas and dust. And perhaps this cosmic dance created our blob baby, X7. It's basically like the crumbs left on the table after a giant space beast. Something like this is actually pretty common, especially around black holes. It's like a galactic fender bender that sends debris flying everywhere. Actually, the universe is full of mystery blobs. They're called the G-objects. No, they're not the G-men from Men in Black, but they're just as mysterious and elusive. These guys have been puzzling astronomers for more than 20 years. They look like gas clouds, but behave like stars. 
It's like they can't decide whether they want to be a cloud or a star. Come on, guys, make up your mind. G objects stretch out at the closest point to the central black hole, but emerge intact, like a rubber band that stretches but doesn't break. Scientists think that they're the stars that have merged together into one. And while doing that, they also produce a huge cloud of gas that hides the result from view. Kind of like when you're wearing a bulky sweater so that no one knows that you've put on a few extra pounds. And then a study published in 2021 found that one of these objects, G2, was actually a molecular cloud concealing three baby stars. Huh, talk about a plot twist. But X7 is the black sheep of the strange blob family. It's significantly different from the G objects, like the weird cousin you see once a year at family gatherings. Its evolution has been more dramatic. Also, it's not being held together by a mass lurking in its center. So what is it being held together by? Pixie dust? Magic? We need answers! That's why scientists believe that X7 isn't a G object itself, but debris left from it. Or maybe not. We have no idea. The possibilities are endless, and that's what makes astronomy so exciting. So let's keep our eyes on the skies and see what other strange objects are out there. Who knows, maybe we'll discover another mystery blob, and this time it's going to be a spaceship. Now that would be awesome.